So it is my great pleasure to introduce Michael Brutno, who is a professor at the University of Toronto and the director of the Center for Computational Medicine at the University of Sick Children in um, Ontario. And he's very much interested at, um, in the intersection between machine learning and medicine and working on computational methods um, that will allow us to provide healthcare much more easily uh, than we are doing right now. Thank you, and it's a, really a pleasure to be visiting you guys at Microsoft where you're doing some of the sort of cutting edge work that's feeding into the things we're doing. And uh, so, um, as uh, Ursula said, um, I'm really interested in how to improve the, uh, the, cl the clinical workflow and the doctor patient interaction process with smart medical devices. And, you know, even for those of you who are not sort of in the medical side of things. Uh, you probably know about the pain of medical data and medical records. And this is, uh, I should update the year on the slide, uh, but uh, this is sort of what the medical data looks like today. Uh, you know, doctors claim to be collecting lots and lots and lots of data, but in reality that data is sitting to what I think of it like as a broom closet. It's, if you know exactly what you put there, when you put it there, and what you're, you know, and do how to find it, you can go and grab the right, you know, record. But if you sort of, like, I kind of look, looking for something like this, the data is very hard to mine and very hard to, uh, to work with. And the electronic health record systems, which are these broom closets, uh, there's been a lot of work uh, recently talking about this, including in even the popular press. So, um, you know, New York Times Magazine had how tech can turn doctors into clerical workers, talking about the pain of uh, recording data into the EHR systems, or a great article in New England Journal of Medicine called Getting Rid of Stupid Stuff, uh, which talked about how many things in the modern EHR system are really unnecessary and how, you know, entering data into it is a huge, huge pain. And about uh, close to a year ago now, in the New Yorker, if you have not, this is like a really phenomenal article of why doctors hate their computers, talking about all of the human factors issues that go into making the doctor experience with uh, their computer so horrible. So, uh, you know, you guys are all at the tech company, so you may wonder how come we've ended up with this product that the users are absolutely hate, because like, they despise with a passion. And the reason is the electronic health records aren't really built for doctors. They're built for the hospital administrators. Most of the structured data within a hospital, within your hospital uh, medical record, is going to be structured around billing. What do those people care about? Well, what doctors did the patient see? What drugs were they given, prescribed, and um, you know, we need to keep track of those? What tests were run? And who do we bill for this and how much? Actually, if you think about this, what's actually wrong with the patient is not one of the things that they really care about. It's, it's a side effect of all of the other things that you do record, but it's not the core thing that uh, um, that the systems were meant to, to record. And as a result, you know, I emphasize these are electronic health records. They're meant for recording information. They're not meant for bringing value back to the user. And uh, doctors, as a result, see HR, EHRs as a necessary evil and really utilize it minimally. They're there to do their minimum amount of work to get, their, to, get to be able to build a patient, and then I'm done. So it's, um, so, and the second side of this is that actually doctors still spend a lot of time on the EHR, even though they try to do as little as possible. Uh, doctors, uh, this is in an ambulatory setting, uh, time spent clinic directly on patient care is about a quarter of a doctor's time. And they spend almost well, about 40% on EHR documentation or, or review. And this actually 27% does not include the time spent on the EHR system while with the patient. So the EHR is a huge fraction of what the doctor does and is, uh, really needs to be optimized for their use. So the result of this mis, uh, you know, misdeveloped technology for doctors is that the, what we call patient-centric care, which is a big you know, buzzword in the medical space, is that technology is actually over and underutilized simultaneously, and you end up with cases where the computer, rather than the patient, gets the doctor's attention. And uh, you know, 
yeah, and the, while the clinical notes are still quite sporadic, and uh, technology is obtrusive, it gets in the way of the doctor-patient interaction, and uh, so it's both there's both too much technology and it's not being uh, used. So we need really better methods to capture clinical data during the patient visit. And this is, uh, I, I, I often do this as a poll when I, when I give this presentation or version of this presentation in front of doctors. I, I think, how many of you, if you were sort of left alone completely to your devices, how many would you want to use paper and how many of you would want to use a computer? And the vote is always, almost always like, you know, inherently like, I want to use paper for my medical records unless my hospital is forcing me to use a computer. So, uh, but they both have advantages and disadvantages. There are advantages of using paper. That's a familiar workflow. You can draw, you can doodle very quickly. It's cheap. Uh, you can, you know, if, you know, paper costs next to nothing and uh, pens, they also pretty cheap. You can throw them out if you don't like them. At the same time, there are disadvantages to using paper records. Uh, there's missing information. There is, uh, you need extra time to then transfer to the EHR system because at the end of the day, you do need a digital note based on current regulations, and it's a good thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, it's inconvenient to take photos or record the videos if you wanted to you know, capture something in more detail, and it's impossible to compute with notes. You know, doctor's handwriting is as bad as advertised. <clears throat> Computers are, also have their advantages. It can be faster than handwriting. You know, actually, you can type, even if, even if you're a bad typist, you probably type quite a bit faster than you actually write by hand. Uh, it's easier to search, not easy, but easier, at least on paper. It's more structured, and it's easier to share. The identification becomes a bit less of an issue. But there are also significant disadvantages with uh, using computers. There is missing information. There's things that still that you didn't put down. It can be slow and distracting when things don't go right. You know, doctors are finding where is the right form for me to put this piece of data, or where in the medical record did I put this previously that I can find it later. Uh, it impedes patient interaction. If you have a computer screen between you and the patient, it really does not work for a good conversation. And even if it's sideways, and some clinicians are amazingly good at typing and talking over their shoulder, uh, as a patient, you still lose that are they really paying attention when they're back to their computer screen and trying to find a piece of information in the note? And it's still inconvenient to take photos and videos, especially with modern, uh, with, with desktop computers, which is the mainstay of the hospitals. And really, uh, when we started thinking about, well, what should this process look like, uh, future of note taking for doctors, we had to go back to 1945 to see what they thought would be the right way to for doctors to take notes. And this is a Vannevar Bush article uh, called As We May Think, uh, where he coined something which he called a Memex, which is a device that stores for an individual all of their uh, memories and all of their interactions, so that which can be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. So uh, it's actually interesting what Vannevar Bush in 1945 thought a Memex would look like. Uh, it basically was something that looked like a, GoPro camera that's mounted on somebody's head and um, a tablet that you can r use to uh, draw and, uh, and, uh, and uh, pull out and, useful and, and should also be shown information. So, you know, in 1945, uh, he did not have these uh, things available to him. But uh, in 2019, we're getting pretty darn close to having something like that that you can actually pull off. So we started thinking about what artificial intelligence can bring to the field of actually not medical data processing of where there's a huge area of work, but actually clinical note taking. You know, things like handwriting recognition, which has advanced, you know, which has made huge strides recently. Uh, speech recognition, where we can listen to the audio stream be talking uh, between the doctor and the patient and pulling out relevant uh, pieces of text, identifying who the speaker is, theorization, you know, natural language processing to identify what are the key medical terms that have been mentioned in the doctor-patient conversation, and actually giving in real time clinical decision support to give the doctor some thoughts about the data that they've just recorded. <clears throat> so. All of these have been brought to, together in a 
you know, sort of test tool called Pinopad that was built by Jishuan, who is interning here now, which is why I'm visiting in part. Uh, and uh, to, the idea was to build a um, the way of, better way of taking notes. And there you can see this for clinical genetics. So this is just one area of medicine among you know, hundreds, depending on how finely you want to slice it. But um, it's uh, one of the things that uh, you know, we talk about is why is it so hard to build a good health electronic health record system? And it's because you have to build it for all areas of medicine. You know, my research group this certainly does not have the capacity to do that. And uh, what, so what we've been saying is like, let's build something for one group. Genetics is good because we have a lot of interactions with them. It's good because it's very broad. It covers all areas of medicine. But at the same time, there is, the appointments are much longer. So an appointment with a doctor could be an hour. So it's a lot easier to fill in, you know, like there's two minutes for a technical issue that we have to deal with, or here's a new device that you can try. It'll slow you down by a couple of minutes. The doctor is much less sensitive to that than a primary care setting where it's sort of 10 minutes, next patient, 10 minutes, next patient, 10 minutes, next patient. Uh, so, uh, and the system architecture, it's actually built on Surface, and that's what I'm using here to do the demo, and I'll, I'll be showing you parts of Phenopad live. Uh, and as well as uh, we have a HPC system, uh, basically our own cloud where all the uh, speech recognition happens. We also combine it with a local Raspberry Pi-based computer that is, we use to record video of the encounter. If with patient consent, obviously, obviously, all of this with patient consent, and uh, uh, it can be controlled from the surface so that the clinician can start and stop the video, for example, on their surface that they have in front of them. While uh, and same with the audio, if the patient does not want wants the audio off for a short bit of time, that can be done off of this um, off of the device. And uh, what we've done this on the surface because we've really found it to be the best in terms of the handwriting recognition and the, everything that we've played around with. And it, you know, it's been a good device to develop on. So just a very quick demo. I'm going to show demo just a small part of it live, and then I'll play a video for the speech parts. I'm having some network issues from here connecting back to our speech servers in Toronto. But the idea is that it looks like you know paper. It looks like something like this. And... Uh, and I can just as a, you know, start writing. And you can see my handwriting is pretty bad, but um, it's identified that that scribble that I did there is the word headache. And I can click on that, and uh, it is now added to uh, my patient's record as one of the features of that my patient presents with. And if I can actually click it again, uh, it doesn't work here. Uh, you can actually set it to be negative somewhere else. I'll show you to be later. And then maybe if the patient also has fever. Uh, see, eh, that was too bad, but eh, fever does not come up. There we go. So headache and fever. Uh, it's one of the things that the system is doing is uh, if I write something like kidney cancer. You can see that the term that has popped up at the top is actually renal neoplasm, which is the standard way a geneticist would talk about it. Kidney cancer is just a standard, but that's the one that's sort of been blessed as the formal name of the term. <clears throat> Obviously the same thing. And if I write CA, come on. They'll say, hey, did you mean cardiac arrest? But actually, CA could mean multiple things. Coronary artery, corneal abrasion, calcium, or cancer. So I can easily you know, select that. No, actually, you know what? I meant cancer. And neoplasm will show up, and I can delete cardiac arrest. It's not really relevant to my patient. <clears throat> the interesting part is if I, you know, I'll show it again here. If I write CA. You can see it's thinking cardiac arrest, but if I write breast CA, it's actually recognizes that the breast cancer that's meant. So it's aware of the context of the text that I'm actually writing, and it can determine what the abbreviation is most likely to mean 
based on um, based based on that context. It has also other some you know, pretty simple cool features that clinicians have asked us for. For example, you can draw a little square and say, "I'd like to take a photo," and uh, then and then you can take a photo and insert it now. This is now part of my note, and I can draw on it, or I can insert a picture in a similar way, or draw a little, you know, pictogram that makes it uh, usable. So my, the thought here is that this is halfway between a computer and a, um, and a uh, paper, and gives you some of the advantages of both. Similarly, you can easily swap it all back into text, and uh, then download it as a electronic medical record into your into your main EMR system. This has many other features, like you can input whole pieces of text and uh, identify and edit the text on the fly using a pen, just by sort of crossing things out or inserting things, and then saying and then writing out by hand a little piece of text to go into the middle of the medical record, which I won't you know show. And the other part that this has is the audio component. And that is not working live, so I'm actually going to switch back and show a little video part. So can I ask you a quick yep. question? Yeah, so, of course. So Please. there's an ability to kind of pull in templates or other content and just edit as you see fit as you go through the conversation? Yeah, so I can show you, I can show you that. For this, for this, for this. That's okay. That's I mean, yeah, okay. So, so if you have an existing medical record, you can cross something out here at the very top, and then either highlight and then you know, write a note about that. You can insert new content right here. So you just click, pull it out, write some piece of text, and then the handwriting to text will take it into, uh, into actual uh, and, and improve the note. We've used this for clinicians who wanted to basically pre-chart and bring the, what they expect the chart to look like into the exam room with them, and then just quickly update it so that when they leave the room, they actually have the note ready. So clinical practices vary quite a bit between, even within a specialty between individuals. So for those who wanted to pre-chart, we built that, we built that in. So, yeah. And the other part is the audio part, and similar to EmpowerMD, which you guys possibly know about uh, or have built, uh, there are components which allow you for speech analysis. You can turn it on right here. So, uh, and... Uh, And then you have a conversation. The conversation goes through the same text analysis pipeline, and uh, we pull out medical terms. And then you have the ability to confirm them, set them as negatives, as relevant uh, to, your, to your patient as you're, as you're uh, doing this. Finally, the system has clinical decision support. And uh, you know, I can actually show that live. So if I go to right here, I can see you can see the patient has fever and headache. It gives you ideas of what else you may want to look for. And these don't really make sense because these are all genetics diagnoses for a patient who has fever and headache and shows up with that to the genetics clinic, not to their you know, primary care doctor. So don't worry. You probably if it, do not have uh, cutaneous hyperthermia with headaches and nausea. Uh, that's not very likely unless you've uh, uh, recently undergone uh, you know, surgery and, uh, and, and had anesthesia. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, this, uh, but this gives you uh, something else to think about. And it's short differential list, which maps back to OMIM, which is the rare disease, uh, data, uh, rare disease, main rare disease database with diseases that match. And if something is a negative, you can, for example, click oh, I did, to say no fever, and that'll update your differential, or if you add you know, a couple other features that will also update your differential and update other things that you may want to investigate. So the idea is to give this to a clinician in real time so that they can do this while they're with their patient. The differential process is part of the, you know, thinking about clinical decision support, it's super important to get this done in real time as the doctor is with the patient. You don't want the decision support once the doctor has left, uh, the patient has gone home. Yeah? Do you, do you intend or do you see a, a use case where this is a training tool? It, so what we have found is that for the differential parts, you know, our differential and our decision support is much worse than an experienced clinician at this point. So an experienced clinician gets very little value out of that. But a junior clinician actually gets quite a bit. 
So the fellows who are seeing, it's like, this is the first time I'm seeing disease X. I, I, I've read about it in the textbook, but I don't know about this. And this is very common in the rare disease world. This is, uh, for them, this is very valuable. And, and it, so it, it gives them some, and it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it gives them thinking points. It gives them, I've, have I thought about that disease? Maybe even if it's wrong, but why is it coming up on the list? Hey, oh, it's like those three symptoms match. So it's, it's actually as a training tool, it could be very valuable. And, and sick kids is a teaching you hospital. You ask some of those questions. Sorry? Right? You would need to note, you know, kind of extract some of those answers from the patient as well, yes. right? Yeah. So, so some of these are obvious, you know, but some of them, you know, um, you know, tosyndactyly. It's like, have I asked the patient to take their socks off? Yeah, to like syndactyly is one of the two fingers joined, fused together. If you have toe syndactyly, you wouldn't know if, if you have shoes on. So it's, uh, so it's, uh, and do, knowing to do this as the patient is still in the room, not you know calling back and saying, hey, by the way, are, do you have fused toes? Uh, so, so I think so. This is the shows you, sort of uh, the. Oh, can turn off this stuff. Uh, this shows you sort of the brief overview of how Phenopad works. Uh, what I want to do now is talk a bit more about the machine learning that has made Phenopad possible. And this is work by a couple of other students, uh, some with Jishwan's help as well. One, to talk about named entity recognition for ontological concepts. So how do we, when you know, the patient writes kidney cancer, or sorry, the clinician writes kidney cancer, how do we know that they actually meant uh, renal neoplasm or small head is the same thing as microcephaly, is the clinical term. Uh, and this is the work of Ariane Arbabi, uh, a PhD student in my group. So the goal is to really take unstructured text here, we've assumed that the speech to text part has been done, and annotate it with structured terms. So there is a little paragraph here, and it can give you a few seconds to sort of scan it. Uh, very briefly to see if you can, uh, you can finally see there's quite a few medical terms that are mentioned in it. Uh, you know, we can highlight a few of them. There's a few others. Um, and um, then how do we pull, pull these out? So the terms that we actually want to pull out are human phenotype ontology terms. HPO is the rare disease ontology. It's great for genetics. For those of you who are sort of more familiar with broader medicine, you may have heard about SNOMED CT which is the, the whole clinical world. HPO is just the genetics phenotypes, things you can see in the genetics clinics. So you won't have broken bones. You won't have like a broken you know, fibia. You will have propensity to break bones, which is a genetic phenotype. Um, and then you know, which bone you break is sort of depends on what, what part you hit. Uh, and this is hard work of Peter Robinson, the Monarch Consortium. I always make sure to acknowledge them because this is a huge service to the rare disease world. So if you go back on the annotation example, some are pretty easy to pick out. So biliary atresia, there's an HPO term called biliary atresia. It's, you just pull it out, it's there. It's, you, know, you can do it with a control F or a little grep. Others are trickier. Like craniofacial changes maps to abnormal facial shape. And abnormal facial shape, if you look in HPO, it has lots of synonyms. It has things like facial dysmorphism, which is I think the standard term. Uh, no, it's, it's one of something that's commonly used. It has unusual facial appearance. It has funny-looking face. And if you're hanging around doctors enough, you will hear uh, you know, them discussing FLKs, funny-looking kids, uh, but, uh, which is certainly not politically correct. But, but, but has, it doesn't appear in notes, but certainly I've heard it, uh, I've heard it mentioned by, in casual conversation. But um, uh, abnormal facial... But, Craniofacial changes is not one of those things. So how can we actually identify that from the text? So there are lots of challenges with this. There are 12,000 terms in HPO. So if you think of classic named entity recognition methods, you need 12,000 different classes, training data for each of those classes, and that's not going to scale. Um, and uh, so named entity recognition methods such as you know, LSTM-CRFs work well for a few classes, less than 10, when you have training data for those specific classes. And um, here we have some labeled data, but it's really, literally a few hundred uh, abstracts of medical text that somebody has gone through and pulled out the HPO labels. Uh, on the plus side, medical ontologies have a taxonomy of concepts. So 
what I did not show you here, is that different phenotypes here, like coloboma and globe abnormality, are joined into a structure. So you actually know coloboma and globe abnormality are both close to each other semantically, and they're all some kind of an eye issue. So, uh, and uh, more so eye morphology issue. So this structure actually can help enable better named entity recognition. So to do this, we start with word embeddings, which I'm probably in this audience don't need to discuss too much. So mappings of words into high dimensional space so that similar words are in um, are nearby vectors. And <clears throat> further combine the word embeddings into phrase embeddings, where you know, again, pretty standard things, you know, as of you know, two years ago I needed to explain this. Today I don't think you know most people are would be aware, but basically when we take you know words, we have a convolutional layer, max pooling, and a fully connected layer to build an embedding for a whole phrase. So the phrase cancer of the retina, you can take the underlying word vectors and combine them into an embedding for the whole phrase. So pretty standard stuff. What we have done, though, is because we have not just the individual phrase, but we actually have structures among the phrases, we have built a hierarchical concept embedding where the idea is that instead of embedding each phrase completely independently, we're embedding it relative to its relatives, relative to its ancestors. So the idea is that the root term of the HPO is something called phenotypic abnormality, and that has some embedding, possibly zero, 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 every vector being zero. And then I abnormality is something that's relative to this, so a positive vector that adds something to the vector for phenotypic abnormality. Cancer is something that adds something to, their, to its parent, which is also phenotypic abnormality. And then retinal abnormality is something that adds on top of eye abnormality. Retinal neoplasm, on the other hand, is something that adds to both its parents. So it's, one of its parents is retinal abnormality, and one of its parents is cancer. So the embedding for the term retinal neoplasm is going to be the sum of the, what it adds and all of its parents. So it's going to be this, because it combines what's along of both of its parent tracks. And the idea is that this can help us learn better embeddings with less data. You know, we can actually learn about the fact that retinal neoplasm has something to do with eyes and has something to do with cancer, even though those terms don't explicitly occur in the term retinal neoplasm. Right, because there's an eye parent and there's a cancer parent. And then when we have an actual uh, phrase, we can combine, we can compare it with the encoding that we get from the concept encoder. So we encode the phrase separately and compare it to where the different concepts of the HPO encode using this hierarchical structure to actually get a similarity score and say which of these terms is the most likely one. So the idea is to bring the ontology into the machine learning. And this is a sort of a brief visualization of how much it helps. Uh, this is the same, exact same algorithm, but in one case we've basically taken out the hierarchy and said embed everything the exact same way, but without using the, uh, using the HPO structure, the exact same terms. You can see that without the structure, sort of like, it looks like an impressionist painting. The colors sort of all bleed into each other a little bit. While when you use the hierarchy, you get much tighter clusters for each area of the ontology. This is just the various systems. You can take a look. There is this thing called gray thing that sits in the middle. And here it's, I'm not sure where it's in here, right here. So the thing that sits in, all, in the middle of all of this is neoplasm because you can have a neoplasm of any really body part. So it makes sense that from an ontological, from an embedding perspective, it got mapped to the middle because, because of the structure. So we've compared with other methods, so rule-based concept recognizers for, for HPO and for other biomedical ontologies. You know, train, the only training data we used was 228 abstracts, so basically nothing, uh, and uh, with We've used 40 uh, as, a valid, as a set to test the tuning threshold. So the threshold of how close do you have to be to something to actually be reported. And the other 188 were used as testing. And also clinical reports from about 40 
uh, undiagnosed disease program patients. These are patients uh, seen at the NIH for an undiagnosed disorder where clinicians have built notes but also have recorded HPO terms for every single patient. And so I wouldn't be talking to you if the, our method didn't perform better than the previous method. You know, the data is not, the difference is not huge. Here's an interesting part though. So the dash H is what happens when you drop the hierarchy. And you can see there's actually quite significant difference in uh, F measure uh, if you, um, if you, once you, if you remove the hierarchy from, uh, from, the, from the method. The hierarchy helps a lot. So bringing in medical knowledge has really improved our ability to do named entity recognition. Um, we've also expanded this uh, to uh, basically say, well, what if, what if I don't get the right, exact right term? Can I get the, do I at least get a general idea? Do I get a nearby term? And there, what we're measuring here is to say, well, let's say the true patient had these terms annotated in the ontology, but my annotation reported these two terms. It's probably not fair. I didn't get right. I got none of them exactly right. But hey, you know, I got a sibling here, and here I got a parent of this term. So how, you know, how good did I actually do? So what you can do is measure accuracy and uh, based on not just the term, but what's based on what's shared, in, including all of the parent terms. The HPO ontology has is a property. So if something is selected, its parents are also guaranteed to be true. So if you have a coloboma, you have an abnormality of the uh, eye morphology, and you have abnormality of the eye, and you have some kind of phenotypic abnormality uh, more broadly. So if you do this, um, numbers go up. And again, you can see that the method outperforms sort of more standard rule-based methods. Same thing with clinical reports. Uh, and you can see here our recall was quite a bit lower than on the abstracts. But we wanted to know why this is. Why did we actually, why are we, or in our precision as well, why are we finding things that are not in the medical record? So we actually looked back for three cases and did a manual annotation of every false positive that our method reported. There were 73 of them. Half actually were judged by a clinician to correctly add more information. Things that should have been in the medical record, should have been annotated, but they were not added to the HPO list by the clinician. About 8% was something like slightly more specific, like you know, we annotated limb ataxia and the clinicians just said ataxia. And that was like, ah, you know, ataxia is sufficient. You don't really care if it's limb or not. And uh, was not, 17% um, were mentioned as negations. So what the doctor said is, the patient does not have X. And our method is completely unaware of this. And this is actually a huge problem and something that we need to improve on. And about 20% of those were true false positives, things that really were not present, usually investigations or something like that. So something that was a test or something that was just a mentioning of a body part, which for the system felt was abnormality of that body part. So it's, uh, the actual system is publicly available. Uh, you can download it it's under a BSD license, and uh, you can uh, play around with it. It's actually used in quite a few different places. It's besides phenotypes, which I, phenopad, which I just showed, it's used by a tool called Phenotypes that also was developed in my loop, in, in my group, sorry. Uh, some, uh, you know, used by a paper which did data visualization to mine the concepts that could then be visualized. And Foundation 29, which is a group uh, that's associated with Microsoft and Satya is part of, uh, is, uh, is using this uh, text mining tool to mine rare disease uh, patient medical records. The second part, of, again, of how we can use AI to uh, help enable the interaction process. So I showed you uh, abbreviation disambiguation. And this is the work of a master student, Mar Marta Screta. Uh, so we go from you know, things like AFib with RVR to actually fibrillation. Um, with uh, rapid ventricular response. And I mean, the motivation is kind of obvious. You know, people want to use abbreviations, they're, you know, it's fast. Uh, but uh, disambiguating is not trivial. So when you say RT, did you mean retrograde tachycardia, radiotherapy, or respiratory therapy? And there's, a, I think there's also right, uh, just the word right could be another uh, example. So can we disambiguate these abbreviations by looking at the context? And previous work has shown that you can look at not just the local context, but also what other words appear in the document as a global context, as another signal. It makes total sense because even though the 
words right next to a set word may not reveal to you the meaning. The general subject of what the note is about can give you a lot more information. So this is uh, an example, like if you had the phrase, patient was treated with RT in 2018. Well, what's RT? Could be radiation therapy, could be respiratory therapy, probably not retrograde tachycardia, you don't get treated with that, or and not, probably not right. And that you can get from the local context, but which of these two is right? Well, if you look at the global context of the note, and you see that the other things that were in the note are esophagectomy, chemotherapy, thoracentesis, cancer, lung, sort of gives you an idea that radiation therapy is probably more likely than respiratory therapy. So uh, we do this with, again, with you know, deep learning, combining word uh, embeddings for the individual words in the sentence with the more global word embeddings, weighing everything by TFIDF, sort of so rare words get, uh, get the higher representation, combining this into an abbreviation representation, and doing classification with this uh, network. At first, we did this on uh, this sort of what everybody plays with their abbreviation disambiguation in the medical setting with CASI and MIMIC. So we trained all of our embeddings on MIMIC, which is a huge data set of, uh, of medical records that are, uh, come out of MIT. And uh, then we uh, trained the actual model, the CNN, on, um, on CASI. Using, which has about 500 examples for about 70 abbreviations. And uh, did a you know, standard cross-validation train test split uh, and ran it, and hey, guess what? It did really well. So uh, all methods actually do pretty darn well. Even naive Bayes gets you 94% accuracy. But um, you know, with our best model, which combined the local and the global setting, we were able to get 97% accuracy, and we were very excited by that. And then we sort of said, that's great, let's implement this into our model and, uh, and into this, um, into Phenopad. And very quickly realized that most abbreviations we did not have. So we have 67 abbreviations in CASI for whom we have 500 examples of training data. We looked at all acronyms, which is a website, and we actually eventually uh, uh, we, we got the whole, we downloaded the whole thing. It has 80,000 medical abbreviations. About 20,000 of those have multiple possible disambiguations. So you really are talking about a lot more than the 67 for which we have training data. And our first idea was, can we use reverse substitution to eliminate hand labeling? So let's go th through Mimic. Every time we see patient was given intravenous fluid, it was, became, the phrase became, patient was given IVF, because intravenous fluid maps to IVF, and created a training set in this manner. Uh, so, with, and this, so this becomes something with a label of intravenous fluid. And I was like, okay, great. Uh, the problem was that the patient, the phrase intravenous fluid appeared in MIMIC um, 2,500 times, so enough for us to get a decent training set. Another meaning of IVF could be in vitro fertilization. And the phrase in vitro fertilization appears in Mimic zero times. Uh, it's actually, it's interesting, the actual reason for it, uh, we initially thought that just nobody wants to write out in vitro fertilization. Uh, it was actually, the reason was different. Uh, the reason was that the word vitro was thought to be a last name. So Mimic has lots of examples of in square brackets, last name, fertilization. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, still, the point still, you know, is that the in vitro fertilization as a whole does not appear even once. So the question is, how can we generate a training set given this? So to do this, we've actually used multiple other data sets. We still are relying on MIMIC3 and all, all acronyms. We've also br brought in UMLS, which is a large ontology of all medical concepts that we're actually now going to use to help different, disambiguate the abbreviations. And the actual pipeline works as follows. We train fast text and word embeddings on MIMIC, on MIMIC. We collect training samples from MIMIC using reverse substitution, but then we augment the training examples using uh, related medical concepts and finally train the CNN for the classification task. So, this is sort of how this works. When you have, you take all UMLS terms and they mimic clinic notes, 
and you embed the ML, UMLS terms into a high dimensional space. So there you will have things like fertilization, uh, fertilization, assisted fertilization, pregnancy, in vitro fertilization, all in one area, while fluids, intravenous fluids, liquids, fluids and electrolytes, these are all UMLS terms, would be in a very different area of the high dimensional space. So then when it comes time to figure out what are the sample training samples for in vitro fertilization, we take the term in vitro fertilization and say, well, hey, it's really close to assisted fertilization, for which we do have some samples that we can pull out from via reverse substitution. And because assisted is not a last name, at least according to, uh, to Mimic. Uh, and there's also terms like, uh, you know, toxemia in pregnancy, which is not really related, but would appear in the same types of nodes. So the global context is going to be uh, quite similar. Or fertilization, which is, again, not as close, but again, would give you some, would give you some nodes with the same kind of global context. And then we sample from all of these using basically a softmax with a temperature, uh, where temperature helps us really hone in as to how much, how deeply we want to sample from the node itself, if there are any examples, versus nodes that are, the, versus nodes that are further out. Uh, for things where there are examples, so intravenous fluids, we still do the same thing. So we actually you know, have a fake distance of epsilon to the actual node itself, so that we don't sample from it completely. But then we have all of these nodes nearby. And again, the temperature, basically, if you set the temperature to zero, you will be sampling from the, oops, from the node itself completely. If you set the temperature to be really large, you're basically sampling from all of these nodes with equal probability. And uh, we looked at you know, how this performs relative to the various temperatures that we could set. It's actually interesting. Performance on Mimic drops as you decrease temperature, because what really the model is doing, it's overfitting to Mimic. And the lower your temperature, the more you're actually getting things from Mimic directly as they are. While performance on a completely orthogonal data set, going back to the 70 examples where we have ground truth, the CASI examples, actually goes up as the temperature goes up and then sort of stable, you know, stabilizes and falls back a little bit. So we ended up using Bayesian optimization with validation loss on Mimic to optimize this, but leaving out the sort of really small numbers because Mimic would, that's where it sort of tends to push them. Oop. <clears throat> and uh, you can see that when you add this relatives, the model that we have uh, built right now, it gives you quite a big push in terms of accuracy on CASI, both in terms of micro accuracy and macro, macro accuracy, about 8% higher than you get with the exact same model, but, on, uh, but, but not using the relative sampling just from the nodes themselves. And um, while interestingly enough, performance on Mimic drops because you're no, you know, you're, you're no longer overfitting to the Mimic data set. You're actually building something that's much more generalizable. So as a conclusion, so abbreviations can be effectively disambiguated using local and global context. And the prior medical knowledge can help overcome some of the biases in our training data, but still a large gap you know, remains. We were able to get 97% accuracy by training on CASI and testing on CASI. We're able to get 73% you know, accuracy by not using a CASI at all in any of our training and not having any hand-labeled instances. Still a lot of work to do, uh, but hopefully this is a way forward. The cool part about this is now we can do all 80,000 abbreviations, better or worse. The problem being we don't know how well we're doing because we have no gold standard data to even uh, to test on besides the 70 that uh, CASI has provided us. So uh, finally, I just want to summarize some of the things that I've brought up in my talk. And um, I talked a lot about, you know, what, going back to the original point, AI-enabled note-taking. What I'm trying to do with this work is to really use technology to assist the patient interaction, to make sure that technology is a participant in the care of the patient and not an impediment to the care of the patient. And to do this, you know, the goal is to really capture everything, notes, speech, and eventually video. We're already capturing video a bit, but we don't really know what to do with it. And there are lots of privacy concerns with capturing video. So at this point, you know, the, but at the same time, eventually, you know, when you say, you know, does it hurt right here? 
And the patient said, yes, well, unless you had video, you don't really know what, uh, what really happened. So I think eventually we may go there as well. Uh, you want to generate recordings that are easy to browse, going back from the not just looking have the whole speech, but actually pull out the information and um, locate important information automatically. In the future, as you're discussing with a patient, as a clinician is discussing with a patient a particular indication, you may want to pull out previous and relevant reports. Oh, you're complaining about you know, knee pain? Oh, let's see, oh, I guess I see you had a, you know, a soccer injury for which you had surgery on that knee 20 years ago. How did I know that? Well, hey, I, the medical record should be able to identify knee pain. Like, okay, let's find out all of the knee-related notes that I have previously for, the, for my patient. And, f and provide the clinician clinical decision support on the fly beyond the differential diagnosis, which is what I showed you in, for genetics. But you know, what, is this, what is the right dosage of a medication you know, on the fly? I'm going to give you X, or given that the patient is, has this weight, and uh, you, know, you may think about this dosage as a starting dose for this medication kind of thing. And really, as we're evolving, we need to start think, stop thinking about electronic health records, and we need to start thinking about electronic health systems. So an electronic health system is an active participant in the care of the patient. It's there with the doctor and trying to walk the doctor through what could be the things that are uh, a problem. And, and uh, it records the clinical data non-invasively helps the clinician navigate previous notes and tests, structure data with computation in mind, and be built uh, with data sharing in mind, which is not something I've talked about, but really de-identification on the fly, being able to share a case with a colleague on the fly and get a second opinion quickly. These are all things that really need to be built into the electronic health system of the future. Finally, I need to acknowledge the people who did all of the hard work. So Jishwan led the development of Phenopad, uh, working with a team of uh, software developers and students. Marta Shkreta did the abbreviation disambiguation and had help from other grad students in my group. And Ariane did um, uh, named entity recognition work and, uh, uh, with uh, folks at NIH and uh, machine learning folks at, uh, at Toronto. Finally, thank you for your attention. And very happy to take any questions, obviously. Yeah. When you um, are doing the global context, are you also taking in account previous notes for that specific patient? No. So we don't have that, right? In, in our, uh, we have, we, we don't, uh, we, we have the global context of that. No, uh, I guess, yeah, we do have that. We could combine it over various uh, notes for a patient. I've not thought about that. That's a very cool idea uh, uh, because that obviously would have a lot of, uh, information as well. We've just been doing global context with, at the note level. So what are the other words in the note with the idea of thinking that a cardiology note is going to be very different than a, you know, oncology note. You don't have to, uh, at least for the data, just as a follow-up question to that, at least for the data that you do at your hospital, you don't have to de-identify content, do you? No. I mean, for the data we're dealing with internally, no, we don't have to de-identify it. But for our data, we don't have, we have zero annotations. You know, we, we don't have anybody who we're paying to go through and look at every abbreviation and say what it actually meant. So... That's one of the problems we have here, which is when we license de-identified data, you don't have the, you, you, can't, you can't get long, longitudinal records because... Oh, because it's identifiable once it's longitudinal? Yes. Interesting. Yes, so they change the patient ID for every one of them. So when you get that, you, you just don't, you don't get longitudinal data. Uh -huh, I so. yeah. I, I, yeah. Same kind of question for the clinician. It seems, I mean, I, I'm not a clinician, but it seems like a clinician will be doing similar things in their practice all the time. Okay. Do, you, do you take that into account? So right now, no. Uh, but obviously, you know, when we're, when we're looking at the global context, the notes, written, other notes written by the same clinician are going to have very similar global contexts. So it's going to be taken into account a bit naturally. Obviously, you know, if you, the more information you can build into the model, you know, same patients, you know, same doctor, re second visit for the exact same thing, you know, that's uh, additional information that can be used to better mine the information and uh, better come up with a note. 
you know, on the Empower MD side, the team side, you guys are generating the note, which is not something that we're doing. And there, it's like, well, okay, take the previous note and see what has really changed between the two interactions. That you know could be very powerful. But um, for us, you know, for now, we're just sort of we're starting from the top and. Uh, uh, and it's you know the, the difficulty with a lot of this work is not the machine learning, it's the human factors. It's actually getting the clinician time and getting them to use the device. You know, hey, by the way, we'll be waiting by your clinic door at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning to make sure that you try using this with all of your patients today. Otherwise, you know, if something goes wrong and you know they they just ignore it. To follow up on that one. Have, have you done usability studies like? Yeah. yeah. So we're in the middle of a usability study of Phenopad. We're, we've uh, used it for about a dozen encounters where afterwards we evaluate both the patient experience and the doctor experience. Where I think where we think the patient experience is actually a very significant variable as well. So it's, uh, you know, given that we have relatively small numbers now, I can't really say much. It's statistically significant, but overall the response has been positive. Uh, and are you, like, what are your key performance indicators on that? Like, are you looking at FaceTime? No, I, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's surveys. It's basically, oh, surveys. we're see. doing surveys of the, of the patient after the encounter. We're doing, with the doctor, we're doing a bit more. We're doing interviews before and after usage of the tool uh, to understand their workflow and then to actually evaluate how, what went wrong or what went right. For the, for the, for the patient, it's just a survey. Do you feel like the, doctor paid more attention to you using this tool than via using a computer and the keyboard? Or do you feel like the doctor was distracted with, uh, you know, with the, this tool, things like that? How, how do you get the patients to actually answer the survey? Uh, we catch them as they're leaving the room. <laughs> yeah, this is, how do we, how, the question was, how do we um, make sure the patients actually answer the survey? And, and the answer is like, you know, if you're there as they're leaving the room and you give us like, can you please do this? It'll take you 30 seconds. Uh, you, you, can get the, you can get pretty decent responses, <laughs> your response times, response rates, sorry. Mike, if I ask you, do you mind moving back a slide? You had a table of precision numbers with different approaches. This one? Something like that, for example. I'm just curious. Uh, those are good to compare different, for example, Minic versus Casi. But if you have a system that is taking notes, and for, for it to be, since you've been interacting a lot with doctors, and all, what would they expect? It's 90% a good number, do they want 98? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> they want 100, but, uh, but, uh, but um, you know, and this is where it's sort of, you need to work around the accuracy uh, to some extent. So one of the things that I showed really briefly here is that when you you know write you know RA, uh, uh, and you can actually click on that, and say, well, actually, no, I did not mean that term. I meant something else. So if you make it very easy in the user interface for them to correct an error, uh, at least our experience has been that they're uh, receptive to that. But obviously, there's going to be some fraction who is going to throw this out and say. You know, this is useless. And so the, you know, I think I know Ranjani's approach is that there should not be a user interface. And that's, uh, and that's, and then, no, and that's, and that's fair enough. It's, it's, but it's, uh, uh, but, but uh, your point is, is quite good, quite, is, is valid. You know, is 90% good enough? Well, if, if, and the feeling is if it's 90%, where in the other 10%, you make a deadly error. Uh, no, obviously, but if it's 90% where in the other 10%, a term gets missed in the electronic health record and really it's still there as RA, just it's the wrong kind of RA, um, maybe it's tolerable. It, it really will be in a case-by-case -case specific basis. Yeah. Kind of along the lines of Steve's question, because I mean, I, I think as a clinician, if it happens once, uh, I'll choose from 10 or 15 things. But the next time and the next time, I would want it to really say, yeah, it's always we know RA. Or not, most of the time I do this, right? So yep. if, I, if my selection choices go down to something, then I as a question would say, oh, this is actually kind of useful because it gets it right every time. But if I have to yep. repeat this exercise every single time, I'll get really frustrated. So we're actually collecting those corrections that, that the clinician is doing. We're not using them yet, but that data is getting collected in the system at my guess is it would be physician specific. Oh yeah, I, I mean, if well, Johnny would have a different list than me. Uh, 
Yes, I mean, and, and so it's important to, to, to get that data per user and update the system with user. And this is sort of, again, like the AI needs to be a part of the U UI. So along the, the, the lines of personalization, are you thinking about, <coughs> have you thought about um, the, the, I have my own abbreviations, and I want to have them be a part of your system, but maybe, obviously, you don't want to affect the model because they're personal. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I think that's very fair for a commercial product. We would certainly, you know, that certainly would be the case. I think where we're at is we're trying to build a uh, something that we can test in a hospital environment and, you know, write a paper or a few papers describing uh, how well it worked and then potentially work with, you know, a bigger partner in terms of getting it to a commercial in getting some of the technology that we have built into a commercial grade system uh, where I'm not, you know, planning that this be sold, uh, you know, to compete with EmpowerMD in the next couple of years. It's, 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 not, it's not our goal at all. Yeah. Is there any behavior change from the clinicians that you wish for to make this? Yeah, it's a great question. We, just, we were just discussing this before about how, you know, it's actually great to take advantage of the behavior of clinicians who tend to, for example, restate everything that's, uh, oh, you know, I have, I have knee pain. Uh, oh, so you have knee pain. So basically using the fact that the clinician is going to restate it if it's important uh, and get confirmation. Um, I think that... Um, uh, I, 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 it's a good question. I, I've, I haven't thought about it, but uh, one thing I would uh, you know, say is that for pretty much every single rule of thumb that I've come up with about uh, how clinicians behave, I found lots of counterexamples. <laughs> so, you know, talk about behavior change as a whole, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. I, I would say that the, if, there, if I were to pick on something, I would not pick so much on the clinicians as on uh, administrators who make it very difficult to, um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to bring new technology into a hospital, even on a trial basis. It's uh, for good reason, but still it's, uh, the, the number of roadblocks thrown up, sometimes valid, sometimes not so much, is, makes it, makes, makes it uh, really problematic. So not so much clinicians, no. Is there an analogous um, environment that doesn't have those constraints where this exact same methodology could be tested and proven up? You mean like outside of the hospital environment? Yeah, I have no idea. I'm just curious. Like, good question. I mean, a lot of the work is really like a lot of the ontological work in the you know is really medicine specific. So that's going to be hard to validate outside of a medical setting. Uh, but that's a good so question. Are you talking about what, for the, the concerns that administrators might have for testing purposes? Uh, yeah, for testing purposes, I'm just wondering, can like could this whole thing be mapped to like I don't know uh, the dog world or some, not even uh, health wise like is there a, a, a that's yeah i mean that's could be an interesting uh, because they have uh, they have uh, you know it, 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 yeah some of the previous tools we built for human genetics were then actually used by vet clinics um, and, and actually dog breeders who wanted to track their dogs and like uh, we had the pedigree drawing tool and they wanted to track which dogs descended from which dogs and built a pedigree of like a thousand dogs um, and um, but uh, no, vet, vet medicine may be an interesting one. I've uh, actually not explored that that much, but that's an, that's an interesting thought. When I was thinking, actually, I, I said dogs, and that's a good interpretation of what I said because that's kind of what I said. But um, what I really was trying to drive at is there like a system that has the same types of, like an, uh, an ontology and, and, and different types of ways that you can do the same connectivity mm -hmm. that you're doing to develop your mapping and your models. Um, but it has nothing to do with this. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just thinking, it's like, yeah. Yeah, I can it, tell you, customer support has, like Microsoft actually has, it's very, we discussed it yesterday about, yeah. like, it has very similar, a lot of similarities with, with medicine. Uh, and and tr any kind of troubleshooting mm -hmm. uh, kind of follows yeah. kind of similar pattern. You don't have, though, you don't have the real world, like real time face to face interaction, which uh, is. Yeah, it's phone, so you, you have you have audio, but uh, but you know they are like the form factor would be completely different. You know, you still have an ontology, you still have you know the, the fact that you have to write is gone. Typing would be probably much more efficient. 
Um, no, I mean, there, there, are, there are examples. I haven't thought about it that much, but I'll, I'll think about it. And even vet, vet medicine is actually is, is not a bad example, but I've, I, that's worth thinking about. Uh, I was wondering, like, if, um, like, I, I know that surgeons tend to draw a lot. Yep. Would drawing group be part of, like, the note-taking as a... Oh, yeah, I mean, obviously. No, I mean, drawing is fundamental, and that's why, you know, compute, what, that's one of the problems with computers. If you want to now get a drawing into your electronic health record, it's... Uh, so, uh, like I was thinking, like a drawing that would turn into an image set, an anatomy, like the way words uh, turns into a thing. Yeah, so uh, you can import an image and draw on top of the image, you know, having, and then that's what, you know, a lot of them do, like they have these human bodies with, you know, like for example, if you're doing, um, uh, if you're doing um, joint diseases, you'll, uh, you'll have this drawing where, where the joints are inflated insanely, so like the hands are, you know, like basketballs, but like basketball players' hands and then the tiny, tiny body because there's much less joints in there. And then you can like highlight which of the joints have issues, things like that. Uh, and um, so you basically can import that picture and annotate on top of that. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why I think that the uh, a device uh, that you can actually work with is, uh, is, is, is valuable. Yeah. I have one more question, sorry. <laughs> um, the 1945 um, Van Vandervar Bush? Yes. Um, he had the GoPro like piece on there. Yep. That's um, implied a little bit with the camera on the surface, but that's not quite the same thing, is it? No. Um, what are your. Yeah. That's. The implied question is, are you thinking about that? Are you... We are actually, so we are recording the encounter with a separate video already. We have permission to put a head-mounted video on a doctor. The issues we've run into is that the cameras are too heavy and uh, the batteries don't last long enough. Uh, and uh, you know, sort of, it's, it's, they've been technological issues. Um, at the end of the day, yes, you want that video. Uh, but then the other thing is I don't know, the, I don't have the first clue as to how to actually analyze that data. And videos, you know, if audio brings up privacy concerns, well, videos bring up a lot more privacy concerns. And, and, and a lot of just comfort level, you know, do you really want to be seen, do you want to see, be seen by your doctor or cyborg? Uh, you know, right? Because that's how, you know, you will feel if suddenly somebody walks in with, uh, with that thing on their head, and um, so it's it, 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 it's uh, it's certainly something that we've thought about, but not something we've actually we figured out how to act upon. In grant proposals, I do put you know a doctor with a with a GoPro on them, but uh, but we haven't we haven't turned one of those loose on the kids in the hospital. What are your thoughts about the possible accuracy of such a video? So if if the doctor is probing your abdomen, uh, yeah. is the doctor's hand is obscuring the exact spot, uh, so it's like, can you ever be accurate enough in this case? I, I you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not a video, video analysis person. So you know, I don't know how much you can tell by the from the obscuring of the video. But then, if if they're if the hand is obscuring, then the doctor won't be able to see themselves. Potentially, I mean, they know where the hand is on the other hand, but maybe you can use adjacent markers to figure it out. But I think the video analysis part is still is, is still sci very much sci-fi. It's like, it's you know, if this audio analysis part is you know, if you talk to a doctor, if you still talk to most doctors today, they'll say the vo voice analysis part is sci-fi, but it's it's actually getting there. The video analysis part, I think the this, the you know the technologists will think are, are a bit sci-fi-ish. At least my my, my view. I think they're